This episode of Grilled is sponsored by Rationale, your leading provider in multifunctional hot food preparation equipment. Register now for a free Rationale Live demo at www.rationale-online.com. Right, anyone listening to this podcast, um, please be aware there is some uh, colourful language in there and then certain subjects might be difficult for certain people to listen to as well. If you are listening to around young children, um, I'd suggest that you listen in a little later because it is really fun, it is really interesting and I am a chef and uh, it's just, you know, we're just being natural and we're just having a laugh so uh, it's not meant to offend anyone but there is some colourful language. Welcome to Grilled. I want to eat on the roof whenever I want to eat on the roof, not when you want me to eat it. I just remember Brad's smell of his beard. You just had the biggest, fluffiest beard and I was like, God, he smells so good. <laughs> I don't know why, it's weird. Sometimes you put smell or something to it and I just remember that, well, it's a bit bizarre. Why are you and your chef's white cellar? Are you working? I'm cooking burgers. <laughs> oh, burgers. <laughs> I hope they're not McDonald's. And I just lash it all over the hot toast as it melts and quickly munch it up, crunchy, crunchy, munchy. Dying to get like a piece of your culinary penis in or around their mouth. Uh, welcome to Grilled, uh, a podcast by The Stuff Canteen. I'm Cara, editor of The Stuff Canteen. And joining me for what is the penultimate episode as co-host is uh, Akhtar Islam. Uh, if you've missed any, don't worry. They are all available for you to catch up on. Just search for Grilled by The Stuff Canteen, where you normally get your podcast. Akhtar, what have you been up to since we last spoke? Because you always seem to have a story for me. There's always something going on. Yeah, it's been a busy old day. But you know what? I'm here <laughs> to tell the story. I'm still alive. So you know our guest well, so why don't you introduce him and tell us why you wanted him to join us on the podcast. Right, so I'm going to introduce you to a very dear friend of mine. Um, we've been through a lot together uh, over the years and, um, you know, we've been through a lot of ups and downs, respectively, in our own careers as well. And um, pleased to say both of us are still standing to tell the story. So let me introduce you to the most amazing man you know i've met and chef that i've met in over, over the years and that's uh, mark poynton so uh the man there he is mark much- welcome mark welcome <laughs> to grilled <laughs> not much i can say to that is that <laughs> mate you, you know at the end of the day like from we when we first met so when mark and i first met our only mutual connection was daniel clifford so um i know you'd spoken to daniel the week or so beforehand before we uh we were shooting for GBM, so um, so yeah, <laughs> it was it was it was a, you know so we, we went in and almost yeah we, you know we're there to compete against each other and you know it was a, 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 a such a tough week and you were so unwell weren't you your back was terrible Fuck. that week fucked my back and, big time uh, and the thing is I had to keep stopping myself from patting him on the back every time he did something <laughs> nice. I, you know, I was trying to be nice and I was actually hurting him. So, yeah, yeah. By, the, by the Friday. But, you know, you know, Mark, the reason why I did that is just to put you off your game so I can win. You know that. <laughs> you'd, you'd won it by that point anyway. I don't, <laughs> in, all, in all fairness, though, right, so when we first met, like Actar said, was Great British Menu, 2012, I think. Yeah. Uh, I'd obviously watched you on it with Daniel before and you, you, you're not Mr. Timekeeping, are you, really? <laughs> we've just well, yeah. this. <laughs> and Daniel said to me before and he went whatever you do just get him talking and just get him chatting about shit and he'll put him off his game and he'll be late none the wiser knowing that fucking Marcus Waring was going to be our judge and, you know Marcus what a great cook he is but fuck me he's a stickler isn't he fucking hell yeah. he crucified you for time and on the first day when you were about 15 minutes late 15, oh, that's probably being kind, isn't it? I think it's probably about half an hour late. Yeah. Uh, I thought to myself, I've got this, I've got him here, I've got him. Doesn't matter what happens now, I've got him all the way through this. And I phoned Daniel that night and uh, I went for a couple of beers in Camden where GBM was filmed then, wasn't it? It was Camden, wasn't it? I think. Yeah, Camden, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, I actually went for a beer with the guy who's now my business partner and we met at the brew house or one of the brew dog places or something. We had some pizza and some beer. And I was talking about it and I was like, I'm up against this young, cocky sort of Indian guy. <laughs> one these one these fucking programs before and shit. And uh, 
and he had the same sort of mindset. He's like, yeah, just just put him off his game, put him off his game, you'll be all right, because he'll be late, and Marcus is deducting points, he won't go through. Because we all know the other guy we were up against wasn't very good. <laughs> <laughs> Who was the other one, just out of interest? I'll let Tar tell you, Tar said it on the podcast before. <laughs> <laughs> it was the actor. Um, it was the uh, the infamous Jason Hodnett. Hodnett, Hodnett, something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Jason. Okay. <laughs> he, he's a good. He's a good cook. He's a good cook, but he's a bit young and naive to be honest. With you. Say hello to my dog, by the way. He wants to be on. Hey. So yeah, so he's up against this young kid as well. He was. He was a bit. He's a bit cocksure. And I knew I could cook better than him. That sounds a bit cocky, I know, but I knew I could cook better than him. But actor, I wasn't so sure because. Back to I was one Gordon Ramsay shit and stuff, you know what I mean? So I thought, talk to him and make him late, which is what we did. And uh, Marcus fucking hated it. But somehow you got through. Fuck knows how. Because <laughs> you had a bomb of a fish course. You started yeah, with fish course you had a bomb terrible. of a fish course. Your main course was fucking great. And your dessert was about an hour and a half late from what I remember. <laughs> no, the dessert was all right. The zone was good, but it was fucking late. Really Not fucking hour and late. a half. It's, it's a little bit, but yeah, probably hour and a half. No, no, it, wasn't, it was not that bad. Well, we're not, we've got to watch it back to see what they edited to. Fucking hell. Uh, all I remember, it was a long day shoot anyway. Well, yeah, because the boy, the boy started crying, didn't he? That's, 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 you know, it, it was a long day shoot because the boy started crying. Because <laughs> he fucked up his dessert. But, but that's how we met each other. So before, actually, the night before we started filming, uh, I don't know if I sent you a message first or you sent me a message via Instagram or Twitter at the time. I can't remember. And we ended up having dinner, didn't we? Yeah, well, I, I sent you a message because I thought, because um, Steve Groves in Parliament Square is obviously a great mate of mine. So I yeah. thought, you know, it'd be a lovely place to just go have dinner, just get to know each other, really. And because uh, obviously... Feel I'd out spoken, the competition. Yeah, well, I'd, I'd, <laughs> spoken to, I'd spoken to Daniel as well before... Uh, the, the 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 week shoe and he told me just take him out, get him drunk, and you'll be fine. <laughs> Daniel <laughs> is stirring the pot here. <laughs> the problem is not even get me drunk. That's the problem. <laughs> uh, no, it was, it was it was it was good. It was good. But no, just just for clarity, the reason why I was late on Every my course. starter was because. Every no, no, my, my parfait <laughs> oxidized, didn't it? And it, it was, did. it was, it was it fucking did. great. So I, I thought I'd, I'd, I'd do it again. So I, 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 I made another liver parfait that morning, and I just had to get it to set before I could send it out. Whereas our other respective friend uh, Jason was happy to send his one out great, which yeah. um, fucked it all. Well, I took great pleasure in pointing that out. Yeah, you did. Yeah. See, but what, what? listeners to this podcast might not know about Great British Menu is it's not all filmed in the hour that it's on TV. It's filmed, you know, like BBC might never take me back for this, but uh, so you do a day of filming beforehand where you do some prep and stuff. And that's where they take the main shots of you prepping the food. And so we had a, we had a day of basically, it was about eight hours, wasn't it? Where we were having banter, getting to know each other and prepping stuff. Eight and, hours and the rest. Yeah. It was a long day. It was long. Um, but I'm I'm quite a calm guy in the kitchen. I'm quite probably because of Daniel. I'm very everything's in a routine. I've, I know what I'm doing, and nothing sort of knocks me out. So I was just in there prepping, thinking, "Fuck, I got this shit done. I got that shit done. I got this shit done." Actar fucks up his parfait, and Jason's being a cocksure little wanker, and it's just like thinks to himself, "I've got this sorted." So then we go into the next day of filming, which is actually the day where you say, "Right, you find out you meet Marcus Waring." which you had previous with. Uh, I'd only ever met Marcus via lunch or dinner, so but actually I'd met Marcus before and pissed him off for being late. Uh, Look, so, at least you know I'm consistent, right? Consistently <laughs> late. <laughs> uh, so, so we get through to this day and then Marcus has stood there and it's just like, fuck me, I've got this in the bag. Got this in the bag. Actar's fucking worst person has walked through the door. He's already fucked up his parfait the day before. So he's got to actually now make his parfait within the one hour of filming. And he's making it a traditional method of reducing his shallots and his garlic and his port and his this stuff and 
having his butter melted and his eggs, bringing it all up to temperature. He's blending his fucking chicken livers and then he's cooking it in a bain marie. And this whole process takes about 45 minutes before you chill the fucker down. But we've only got an hour because he fucked it up the day before. <laughs> so, and that, that's, that's why you're really late on the start. <laughs> hey, but, hey, look, I, it was lovely the day before. <laughs> Nature took its place, took its course, and alas, we are where we are. So uh, you still uh, won. You still beat me. I know, but it's just that you know, for me, I just could not. I knew I was going to get a fucking hiding for being late, but I'd much rather do that than send out dog shit. Like yeah. that, that that's always been my thing. I'd much rather get a kicking, for, and that's why with all these, you know, if it's not right, I don't care. I'd much rather get a kicking for it being wrong as opposed to it being shit. It's stress situations like that where you, where you meet people and that's where you forge proper friendships. And, you know, it's endured now nearly, well, we're nearly 10 years in. Yeah. So. Well, yes, you are. Despite beating Mark, you are still friends. So, I mean, <laughs> I can't guarantee that by the end of this podcast, but <laughs> you've done well so far. 10 years is pretty good going. Um, shall I do the uh, questions on this? spinning wheel of truth well yeah. just just so you know before you get it's not like the wheel of fortune at home uh when you watch it on tv i've not won a single prize yet so you're not going on <laughs> holiday and there's no cash prizes mark so here we go what's in your fridge at home right now pastrami goat's cheese spring onions tomatoes and some leftover curry I love that you know that. <laughs> Not last. I cooked dinner last night. So me and the wife had some, uh, it's gonna, this is going to sound really wanky. Uh, we had some uh, Bavarian retired dairy cow sirloin. I, I actually dinner. saw that on Insta. It looked look good, yeah. man. Uh, with Hasselback potatoes and roasted spring onions for dinner last night. So, oh. so I knew in the fridge, so I cooked dinner last night. Nice. And does your fridge look like that when you're like normally... 12, 15 hours in the in the restaurant. Well, <laughs> Is your I, fridge at home I, normally I, that exciting? It's normally empty and it's whatever I bring upstairs. So, <laughs> <laughs> so normally, normally foie gras or lobster or... <laughs> oh, nice. Fancy <laughs> fridge. <laughs> I'll tell you what, so talking about fridges, so I was filming um, um, with, you know, the hairy bikers. I was doing a program with them and they were in my kitchen and one of the parts were you know, to go through my fridge to see what's in there. And, um, and it was all, it was, it was full of booze and <laughs> half, a, half a stick of butter and nothing else. And <laughs> we opened it and then the, 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 the guy uh, filming and the director on, on site with me at mine said, Look, mate, yeah, we won't, we'll skip that part completely because it looks like you've got a problem. Close the <laughs> fridge, that, we cut that out, but yeah. Yeah, so that's that sounds about what's... that sounds more like a chef's fridge. That's what I'm used to hearing. Mark sounds like normal. <laughs> so <laughs> there's half a bottle of white wine in there as well. But you know, it's... oh, good. Right. I feel like it's a bit more normal now when you hadn't mentioned any alcohol. So <laughs> the wife will be home soon, so she'll drink. <laughs> right, that's all. Oh, uh, something that you resent paying for. I tell you what, I, I resent paying for parking, <laughs> especially outside Summer Row. So Summer Row, it was a part of the city that was, it was, it was a really like bustling part of the city when it was owned by my friends. It used to be a, basically a nightclub complex where basically all the footballers around the Midlands used to hang around and, you know, it was great. And I used to drink there um, pretty much every weekend. Um, and then through some restructuring and the changing of the road work, uh, the road network in Birmingham, that place actually got cut off for about six or seven years. So that was the end of that whole stretch. And that stretch had been around for about 15 to 20 years. And it's now, you know, it's inaccessible. So it became derelict. So I took that stretch on and, you know, I've, I've redeveloped that whole stretch over the last four years. And, and it pisses me off, considering that the city council couldn't give a shit about that road. I basically regenerated that whole street. I've even fixed the pavements and everything else. And I still have to, when I park outside, I have to fucking pay. Like, 
you bastards. You know, you didn't care about the tree, and now I fix it. You put all the bait in, and now you're charging me to park outside the road I had to re- pretty much rebuild. So, yeah, fuck them. That's what I re- resent paying for. Well, I think, like, I think resenting paying for parking is quite a valid one, actually. I think most of us probably resent at some point paying for some parking, so. <laughs> and it's not cheap. It's like £35 a day. A day? So, yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> Just get a taxi to work and a taxi home. Be cheaper. <laughs> that, that That is true, but... I don't know. I just I always like having my car on hand. I don't, I don't know why. Throughout that, I probably drive about four and a half thousand miles a year, so I don't actually use my car much. <laughs> but it's just you know what it is. It's it's habit. It's you know habit is this weird thing, and it's just nice having it out there. Knowing when I finish off work, I can just step into that. And I'll be home in like eight minutes. So right, Mark. <laughs> yeah. Something that you're glad your parents don't know about you? They will now. <laughs> well, there's fucking lots. Uh, my, dad, <laughs> my dad only joined Facebook last year, so he's missed the whole fucking generation of shit. Uh, me and Axel are the same age. We're both 40 now, Axel. Are you 41 yet? I am, mate, yeah. Yeah, so we're, we're born in the same year, roughly. Uh, I grew up in a time in the north of England uh, where there was lots of all-nighters, be it cream, in Liverpool, Hacienda, and that sorts of shit. And I first started working at a hotel. Well, not my first job, but my first chef's job was in a hotel in Chester called the Queen Hotel. Uh, I was 16, so 1996, 97. And uh, I quite often finished a dinner service at 10 o'clock, jumped on the train to Liverpool or Manchester, went to all-nighters, kept awake by many class a drugs to go back and do breakfast <laughs> there you go mom and dad there you go mom and dad yeah. <laughs> yeah. Probably a bit hard that, but yeah that's that's something they don't know they know most things to be honest with you but that's probably one they didn't know until now whenever i was out late i was out doing great community work helping <laughs> the needy um on the odd occasion i'll go to prayer meetings and <laughs> Yeah, it's really good, wholesome stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and yeah, pay- exactly. <laughs> oh, mate. It's yeah, interesting, no, though, because we were talking about that with um, Callum Franklin, weren't we, Acton? He was saying, obviously, when he first got into uh, into kitchens, that that's how it was. You just you stayed out until, what? well, all night sometimes, and then just yeah. went straight back in to breakfast or for prep or whatever. So, yeah. You're not on your own, I don't think, Mark. No, no, no. no. There, was, there was many a 36-hour day. Trust me, but many a... To, like, I don't know why I would do that, because looking back at it, you think, why the fuck would you do that? Why would you put yourself through that? Were you sleeping on the kitchen floor or, or you know, a, a part of the, the restaurant where you just lay some whatever out and then just, just, you know, get old napkins and make yourself a pillow to lay your head down for, like, 45 45 minutes or so because you know you've got to be up because the the the, the deliveries are coming in you're gonna to have to start prepping and stuff like that why i i often do look back at that that part of my life and i wonder like why did you put yourself through situations where you're sleeping one hour a night you're looking back and you know you often get asked the question would you live your life the same again fuck no no of course not and that's the thing it's like and i know this that is I th- I'm hoping as time, to, I think, especially with the new generation, that's not so much the case anymore, is it, Mark? I think the younger kids that we work with, they tend to be a lot more health conscious. They're not so, I don't want to use the term diehard because it was almost glamorizing what, what we used to do. Or let's just say they're not as stupid as we are or were. <laughs> and, you know, they, they value their sleep. And, you know, when this, you know, I don't know why we, there's absolutely no sense in it because when you look back at it, was it actually fun? Was it fun to be exhausted all the time? Was it fun to push yourself to a point where, you know, you, you could have done yourself some serious harm? Some of us have done and, and others have been lucky enough to pull away just in time before it became something that, you know, could, could affect the rest of your life. But we've all done it, you know, we've, and, and I don't know, it, it is something that's within our industry that almost, and I don't think it's, intentionally glamorized or no one 
<clears throat> no one made a point of turning this into like, this is the way you've got to be. If you work in kitchens, if you're a chef, this is what you need to be. And this is how you need to be living your life. But somehow it became the done thing. And it's quite, you know, a, a classic picture of a, a, of a chef, even on a weekday at six in the morning, got a fag in his mouth, looks like death because he's been out drinking all night, getting ready, trying to stoke himself up ready for the day service so you know breakfast is a fag and about eight red bulls you know like yeah. and, and a bar of snickers if you're uh putting yourself you know if you you know if, if you're treating yourself so that that way of like i'm glad that's come to an end and like like mark says when you look back at it and you think you know is it was it worth it would you do it again no fucking way i'd much rather go home and go to sleep <laughs> yeah but it, it was <laughs> probably it was, Probably wouldn't be so great now. <laughs> it, it was a generation thing, though, because if everything at the time in the 90s was about work hard, you know, yeah. even if you, all the TV programmes were work hard, I think, you know, the music was work hard, play hard, I think it was. Whereas now the generation, isn't that the generation now is about don't work, take it easy, relax. If you feel what, stressed. What is, what is, um, <laughs> is it living your best life? That's the new thing, right? Well, yeah. we were get work hard, play hard. No, but we wouldn't be where we were if we didn't do what we did. And that's the difference. Which is fair, which is fair. I mean, which is fair. But I think the journey that we went through could have been a little less painful if we called, <laughs> if we called it quits at 2 a.m. Yeah, well, I, I, I remember the day that I stopped all that shit. It was December the 9th, two, uh, December the 9th 1999. Uh, day before my 19th birthday, and I thought, I actually thought to myself, I didn't have an epiphany. I didn't see God or none of that shit. You know what I mean? I just like, I'd spent many a day drinking in between splits and going out on all nighters and benders and shit. And I just thought to myself, there's got to be a better life to this than this. And there was. And that's the day that I applied to work at Juniper for Paul Kitchen. So I thought, you know, if I'm going to make a life for myself, I've got to stop being a bell end. And that's, that's when it changed for me. I think 19 is quite a, a young age to have that thought because I know people in their 30s that are still doing that and need to have yeah. that thought. So yeah. probably am, They probably haven't been as much of a end as I was, though. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> 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 well, that's a nice uh, nice little treat for your mum and dad when they listen to this podcast anyway. Yeah. So. <laughs> right. <laughs> Last one for you, Akhtar. <laughs> Two things that you would take to a desert island... Is there food available on this island? Oh, you're breaking this down now. It's just two things that you couldn't live without, basically. Um, but you also need to survive on this desert island. So, all right. So, I'd need I'd take my Conroe with me because I like you know grilling me you know food. <laughs> I, I, that's good. So that and then um, you could make a fucking barbecue on the beach, you lazy fuck. No, mate, mate. Have you <laughs> have you watched? Bloody, what's what's the one with Tom Hanks, Castaway? You see the yeah. amount of shit you went through to try and fucking get a barbecue going. Fuck that. I'm <laughs> taking charcoal. So this, this is part of one package. Loads of charcoal. Loads of uh, a Bunsen burner with loads of gas. This is all one. All right. <laughs> You're changing so the rules. Fire it up. And then what else? Um, other thing after that. Oh, fucking hell. Has, has, has that island got Wi-Fi? <laughs> No, it's a desert I, island. I, I, I struggle to like, you know, I, I struggle to travel light, Matt. Um, I'm noticing. I, I was speaking to a, a friend a few years back about potentially like doing the, you know, the, um, uh, what's that one where they have to eat like kangaroos, dicks and stuff? What's it called? I'm uh, a celebrity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would like, and he, he, he does that program and he's, 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 he's one of the production team. I was like, I would never fucking do that purely because I like to wake up. I like to know I've got a nice bathroom. I can have a lovely hot shower and I can, you know, stand out on the balcony, have my coffee. You know, that, that, that's, that, these are like the must. So I, I, I think I'll take my Conroe. I'd eat loads of, uh, and, and loads of animals. So that's, that's that sorted. And then creature comfort. I'll tell you what I need. You know, um, my lip, lip balm. I can't sleep unless I put lip balm on, which is weird. So, like, no, no, it's fucking weird, seriously. So, 
I can, I don't put it on throughout the day, but at night, if I don't put lip balm on my lips, I cannot actually see. So if I've gone somewhere and I've forgotten my lip balm, I will have to leave the hotel or whatever, go out there or, or try and find a way of getting hold of it. I fucking panic if I don't have it because for some weird reason, I cannot sleep without lip balm. There Mark, you, you two have been friends for 10 years. Did you know that? No. <laughs> And and he's kissed me on the lips and stuff in the past, not in and you know. You realise how soft. And I've never noticed he's fucking. Uh, he's he's wearing lip balm before. Did you see how soft my lips were though? Uh, no, you just, your 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 bristles of your moustache always tickled me. I didn't notice the lips. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> lip balm and you're taking a barbecue. <laughs> so you know what? If I was on an island, I'd probably last about thirty seconds. I'd be like. <laughs> Yeah, Fuck that. <laughs> I'm going to buy you some lip balm for the next time that I see you. <laughs> Thank you. At the moment, I'm using um, it's like cocoa butter one. It's got a lovely aroma. It's really nice. Nice. Maybe we should add that to the staff canteen shop. We could have uh, <laughs> staff oh, canteen yeah, lip balm. Uh, you know what? A lot of times you see chefs and they've got like really shit lips. So you, they need lip balm. <laughs> like you, you like for Christmas, Father's Day, and birthday. My son always does me a little box, which always has uh, loads of like hand lotions and stuff, um, and and there's all socks and lip balm. There's always a little box with that stuff in there, and whatever other present is decided. But those things are always a must. <laughs> right, let's go on to some of the topics that we wanted to chat about. Um, I think I'll, I'm going to start with um, Mark. I'm going to talk about your journey within hospitality. I, I had put other things before that, but I feel like we're laughing too much at the minute to go into those. They need a little bit more concentration. So, <laughs> so yeah, let's talk about your journey through hospitality. So, obviously, uh, uh, Midsummer House, um, Elementum, and you know, you want to start, and you also you lost a star. And I know you've spoken to us previously um, about that yeah. as well. So, talk to us a little bit about your journey. You said it's like twenty five years, didn't you? So, looking back yeah. on it, how has that been? Like the highs, the lows. What would you change? Uh, twenty five years. Twenty five years this year. Uh, came into it by accident. At the time, which I talked about the things my mum didn't know about, my dad didn't know about. Uh, came about because I wanted money to do that sort of stuff that I was doing at the time. Chef told me it was quite good. I should stick to being a chef. You know, I was getting paid more money than I was anyway, so I stuck at it. The highs. Uh, uh, before the Michelin star and shit, the highs were feeding lots of dignitaries even before i cooked in mission style restaurants i fed people like david beckham uh cooked in exclusive hotels in and around manchester feeding all those sort of people whole football teams and shit and that was amazing for a young boy from the north of england that had aspirations of being a football star to feed your heroes so to speak was was mega for me and pop stars people like rod stewart and stuff like that you know people that you don't you don't you can't get close to normally. I was cooking fried eggs for him on a fucking buffet breakfast, trying not <laughs> to bat on them, do you know what I mean? Cardi Minogue, <laughs> Jerry Halliwell, all sorts of random fucking people that uh, you just don't, you don't think that's within your normal grasp. Being head chef for Two Mushroom Star Restaurant obviously is massive, uh, which was amazing. A low to that was finally giving my notice to Daniel, uh, which was really, really fucking hard. And it came about because... I got headhunted for a job and I told Daniel about it and he said, apply for the job, go for it if you want to go for it. So I went to the interviews, never got the job. I went back and he was really supportive and he's like, yeah, you should do it, you should do it, you should do it. And uh, got back from my interview, which I got told I haven't got the job and he said, well, seeing as you're looking for jobs, you might as well take this as you notice. So that's, that's, that's pretty much how the industry worked for me at that time. It's like, felt really good because he supported me, but then got kicked in the bollocks. He's like, you know, you might as well fuck off now. Uh, so yeah, no, it's, it's it's a tough one. So you talk about these highs and lows, and then so then so then more ups come. Obviously, took over Alimentum after Daniel. So I served a year's notice at Midsummer House, which was hell on earth. And, a year's uh, notice. Year's notice, yeah. That's and hell. in that, and in that year, Daniel didn't talk to me at all. 
uh, he touches on that in the book, actually, on in the forward from a book. He touches on that, how pissed off he was that I left, uh, which I won't say too much about because obviously you can read about that in October when my book comes out. It's called It's Just Food. Uh, Good plug there. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, no. So obviously I left and then went to a restaurant called Alimentum, which I became a shareholder in and chef. Never thought about Michelin then because I only thought about cooking food and being happy because I spent eight years, eight and a half years at Midsummer House working fucking hard for someone else to achieve their dreams. And this is something now I can only look back on now because I've lived it myself. I worked my bollocks off for his dreams and his goals and to fulfill his life. It was never, it was never about me at that point. And that's probably a bit selfish on both our behalfs. Uh, so what, however elated I was that Midsummer House was and is as good as it is, it was never mine. So it always, it didn't piss me off, but it, it, it was quite, it put me on a downer quite, quite often more than on an up. So when I left and then went to Alimentum, it's like, finally, I can fuck all the shit away and fuck all Midsummer House and I can think about what I want to do. And I cooked food that I'd wanted to cook for many years. And I'd spoke to Daniel about it and tried to put food on his menu and he's always dismissive because it wasn't his food, which is his prerogative. So then to actually get a Michelin star for serving food, which I never thought was worthy of, it was monumental, fucking mental, absolutely mental. Because I didn't, I didn't even think we were worthy of free rosettes at the time, let alone, you know, being in that upper echelon of, I think it was only 120 restaurants at the time that had one Michelin star. So that was, it was mega and... I don't think it really hit me until two years later, which sounds a bit, probably sounds a bit weird uh, because I never thought I was going to lose it because you think you, you get put on this, you get put on this massive pedestal. And I, I touched on it when I did my interview with Staff Kenty, that you get put on this massive pedestal that you almost feel untouchable because you, you, you are in such a small percent, uh, percentage of people in the world. And it is fucking tiny, tiny, tiny percentage in the world of people that can cook food at that level. Even though it's not you, it's the whole team that surrounds you and everybody that does it. That uh, You actually believe it. You really believe that you are this person that does that. But it's only when I realised that I could actually fucking lose it, which was two years later. I didn't lose it two years later. I lost it five years later. That I realised, fuck me, I'm cooking a Michelin star food in my own restaurant with my own name in this guy that believes it. And that's, that's probably when the big downside hit me. I never, ever got, never got the happiness of it. I only ever got the downside of it, which eventually led into losing a Michelin star five years later. I mean, Akhtar, obviously having just got a, you know, a Michelin star, what, what are your thoughts on that? You know what? I've, I've never, I've never thought about it like that <laughs> because I got the star for cooking my food and all I'm going to do is continue doing that. And I'm going to, you know, so providing I continue in the same vein and work as hard. And it's not like, it's not just me, Neil, Neil and the rest of the team, you know, we, we you know, continue, if we continue the way we do, there's no real reason. If anything, you know, we put more pressure on ourselves. We're working harder and pushing more and more because having the staff has given us so much more confidence. So, you know, our guests always say to us the, the experience that they had month one to month three to month six to month nine. Every time they come back, it's different and it's moved forward and it's that progression. So for us, it's like we're, we're not, we're not I don't want to say we're an unstoppable train, but like we've got that momentum now and we're constantly moving forward. And, 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 and so you know, for me, I don't think about the potential of losing it. It's for me, it's about just continue doing what I do. And, and as long as I, we, 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 we all do what we, we, we set out to do, there's no reason why we shouldn't maintain it. And fingers crossed, you know, we're working really hard to be potentially the first two-star Indian restaurant in, 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 in the UK, in, in, in Europe, because the way we cook is so unique and so different to any other Indian restaurant. It's, it's a completely different approach which makes us very unique in our place. So, you know, and Michelin have been nothing but supportive of us from, from the day we opened. So 
I don't, you know, I, I never think about that. And, you know, touching on what Daniel, so Daniel, we were filming uh, something last year. And, you know, he, 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 even he said, that actor, I'm seeing the way you're cooking is progressing. And it's, it's incredible. And it's just so nice to see the, the, how clean and precise your food is now. And it's just really exciting. So, you know, people in the industry, friends and just, you know, even Claire Smith, you know, Claire Smith, sorry, she, she sent me messages about some of the dishes that I put up. You know, a lot, lot of people within the industry are starting to notice this as opposed to just being a bunch of guys in Birmingham knocking around with spice. So, yeah, so for me, I don't worry about losing here. I, I'm, you know, Mark's known me for, for years and everyone in the industry does know me. No, no, I am a very driven person. I'm not really a negative person. I just, you know, I look at challenges for what they are and they need to be overcome. So for me, you know, the challenge of getting the second star, it's, it's something that we all as a team want to face and we want to, would love to be able to turn around and say we're the first, Indian restaurant to do that and, you know one of the great things would be because we often get um, people often comment because obviously I'm a Brummy, Neil's a Brummy, we're all Brummies and we're cooking food from another part of the world and you know there are often chefs from that part of the world who yeah. who, who who look at our approach and, and obviously for them it's so left field it's out of their comfort zone so it'd be really nice to to, to say that you know two a group of chefs from Birmingham are shaping the future of a cuisine from another another part of the world. And, you know, Birmingham is known for Indian food and our love of spice. And it'd be incredible for, for Birmingham to be able to deliver the first two-star Indian restaurant in Britain, in Europe. And that that's the challenge that we're going for. So for all this staff canteen, and I'm not just plugging you guys, you, you've been the guys that have supported me from since it started at Alimentum when it was just Mark at the staff canteen. Uh, I've always been very supportive. And I think you guys are the first ones I told I was leaving Alimentum because of that. Uh, and yeah, so I decided to leave because there was always ambitions to do my own thing rather than having majority of shareholders overlooking me who would always have the decision. So I decided to do that. And uh, with doing that, and expressing those feelings to them, I got the rug pulled from under my feet and I got made redundant. And fuckers never paid my redundancy two years later. Never mind. But, you know, you can print, you can put, they still owe me 14 grand. Cunt. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's think, a good job I don't have to use a, a bleep, isn't it? <laughs> uh, I, I won't say the names because that's probably legal, isn't it? But uh, yeah, yeah, no, still, don't do that. I don't want to be part of that. That's, yeah, that's fine. It's <laughs> Uh, but yeah, so I think it was the 1st of June 2018 and I've been looking at sites in and around Cambridge and further afield, Newmarket, Brace and Edmonds. Don't know if you know the area, but that's like the two big towns near the area. And while doing that, I was doing pop-ups in and around the area as well. And a mate of mine was running what was called the Ancient Shepherds at the time, and which was uh, an old pub. 500 year old pub and only busy at the weekends for food and drink and so I was doing pop-ups on a Wednesday Thursday night quite regular every other week selling out to 55 people me in the kitchen on my own his front of house staff serving it and it, yeah there's a waiting list for like four months to to do that and but so then obviously I was still looking around but coming back to the ancient shepherds to do these pop-ups then I signed a sort of permanent residency at a place called the Cambridge Cookery School in Cambridge, uh, which is a beautiful cookery school with nice big open service area with big tables. So I sort of, so I took that on and that was two months before the pandemic hit. So I signed this, it wasn't a lease as such, there was no binding agreement, but I signed, signed to say I was going to be at the cookery school as MJP for going forward pandemic hit fucked everyone uh, so we decided to do mj we actually decided to do mjp at home the week before boris told everyone to stop going to restaurants so i think we were a bit ahead of the curve with that uh so we decided to do that and it was fucking huge massive we were, i was doing like so many takeaway meals 16 pound for three courses like 
it was it wasn't like what you do actor your yours is fucking mega it was like proper microwave meals but really nice microwave meals it was like beef bourguignon uh chicken chasseur vegetable lasagna 16 pound for three courses and we're doing like four grand a week on it so it was, it was huge did that and while i was doing that the ancient shepherds where i was doing the pop-ups beforehand came on the market and the landlords approached me and said you've been quite successful here would you be interested in taking it over because the current landlord doesn't want to continue with the business because of covid so um i had a few meetings gosh he came to view the place again and uh yeah signed the deal two years to the day after i left elementum okay in the middle of the first fucking lockdown i got the keys from the first standalone restaurant similar to actor taking on a restaurant oh. yeah. <laughs> 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 Well, I mean, Mark, it happened. Me, a bit stupid. It just, um, we worked up towards it. But, you know, it's that, that whole feeling. I think a lot of people, you know, I think the great thing about you and the, the, the last few years of your career is the fact that, you know, you've, you've experienced great loss. But, yeah. and you went through a period where I guess you had to find yourself again. And, hmm. you know, you've realised you want to, you know, to, 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 to basically put your put yourself out there again and, and put your neck on the line again. And you've relaunched yourself. You've got this new restaurant, which we know is, is going to do, be incredible. So it's, it's, it's that ability, that tenacity to be able to take the hits, but then reflect and come back and come back stronger. And that's the thing that, you know, I, I really admire. I think, you know, you've done, you've done really well. And the fact that you've come back and, you know, you've set yourself up. And yeah, timing's not been the best, but, you know, there's a great, great, you know, future ahead. You know, this, I, I'm confident that this is, this is the last of it. And, you know, moving forward, the back end of 2021 onwards, I think it's, it's going to be a great time for you to, to reestablish yourself and, 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 and shine again and, 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 and cook the food that, you know, people have, you know, learned to love about you. So, I think, you know, that, that's the reason why I think it's really important it's to speak, speak to you is because, you know, one of the things that we're going to touch on early, uh, later on is, is about mental health. And, you know, one of the things about mental health is, is, is you know, life throws so much at you. It's, it's, it's how you deal with that and how you come around it. And I know, you know, you know, losing your restaurant, losing your way of life, losing everything, you know, especially for a chef, that, that is devastating. You know, it's almost like lo- it's like losing a family lo- member. It's not just like losing a job, you know, and it's, it is like losing a member of the family and, or, or a child. And it's, it is that tough to deal with, but it's how you get over that grief. There is a grieving process and the, uh, a process of, of healing and then healing within yourself and then making that, that decision whether you want to potentially put yourself through that again. And, 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 and that's, that's the thing that I really admire, the fact that you have made that decision to do so. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think as you've brought, brought it up, that that was, you know, that is something I would want you to talk about. And particularly, obviously, with the pandemic, because I think that's definitely heightened a, a lot of things for people. So, yeah, like Mark, what, what's your experience of mental health within the hospitality industry, but personally as well? You know, what are your thoughts? What are your mm-hmm. thoughts on it? <laughs> Uh, within the hospitality industry, it's a bit of a, it's still a massive taboo subject, and it's it's I, I, you know I'm not I'm not I, I don't I don't want to say I'm not the person to talk about it because you know we should all talk about it, but I've seen people suicide, suicidal because of what we do and the way I've been part of people have been treated in the past, and it's not you know it's it's a fucking tough industry. But it shouldn't be as hard as it is. We've we've made, and I say we as the generation of chefs that we are, and you know, actor, you you are part of that. I don't want to say that you're as bad as the way it was when I was in kitchens, but you know, I think any chef that was born in the eighties and grew up in the nineties, it was normal to be abused and then to become the abuser. Uh, and so we we sort of. We, li- we lived, I don't say we lived because I don't anymore at all. We lived in the mindset that if you can't do it, you should fuck off because you're a fucking snowflake. And it's not right. In those early 2000s, 
however good it was and however good the fucking food was and it was fucking phenomenal it wasn't right it wasn't right at all and we treated people with contempt and we worked people too hard and I worked too hard and Daniel worked too hard and it just you know it's the things have had to change and things will change you know we only work three and a half days a week now at MJP because you know I've got my two children and my wife which I love with all my heart and I don't you know I need to see them as much as I need to see the restaurant and you know so I've three and a half days of my family and three and a half days of my restaurant and I know that's not sustainable for everybody but people need to it's not it's not a work life balance it's a work is not the most important thing there is there is times that things are more important and we need to be able to see when people are suffering you know i you know i suffered after i left elemental and when i lost the michelin star lost the michelin star because my own fault for losing my own focus you know however i however i paint a picture of Michelin were wrong. I should have kept the star. You know, it's my own fault. They obviously believe I wasn't cooking Michelin star food. It's my fault. So, you know, fundamentally, I have to take that on my shoulders. I, I lost the plot and I took it out of my closest family and friends. And it's because of an institutionalized way of working that we've had for so many fucking years. And the only way it's going to change is if we talk about it and make it better for people. This. I mean, as, as horrendous as this year has been for all of us within this industry, it's actually a great opportunity now to restart the industry and our entire way of life in a way, in a in a better way. So let's let's you know, I, I, the way I look at it, this is a great opportunity for all the inequities that we have or things that we just did because it's the way of things and that's how it's always done. Well, now that doesn't even, there's no such thing as that. We've had a year where we've done nothing. So let's start with the whole industry like we want to continue it. So, you know, for, for us as well, like, you know, we're starting with a four day week. Um, you know, yeah, every, every, you know, all, all the, you know, we've just taken on a load of new, and I know no one's really taken on comedy and stuff right now because they're trying to fill their, their main slots and not taking on trainees and stuff, because you know, a lot of people don't have that luxury. Whereas, you know, we've just, we're taking on loads of stagiaires and loads of, and you know, our stagiaires are paid and uh, we've got uh, commies that are coming on board. Cause you know, we're, we're getting ready for a year's time when everything's back in its swing, where we're gonna have, you know, a, a group of guys that we have trained for a year. And when, if anyone decides to leave, there's someone to take it, take their place. So, you know, I'm, we're going back in a very positive way. and. You know, one of the things that we've always done at, at Ophim, yes, we are, you know, we are firm, you know, things, things, you know, when things are wrong, you know, people are told, but we try and have fun because for me, it's like, you know, these people, they're not just colleagues, they're, they're my family. So, you know, they go through all the highs and lows with me and, and, you know, myself and Neil, we, we put everything into the business and because we do that, everyone else, you know, in the team does the same as well. So, you know, we're all like a like a little family unit, and you know, so so for, for us going back, it's it's a case of just strengthening that way of work and keeping that sense of family and community. And you know, we're trying to do more for the community as well. So it's not only like we're doing stuff for our own business. It's like how can we help other people? So you know, these these are these are the new things, new steps that we're taking, the new attitude, not the new attitude, but you know, the furtherance of what we had aspired to do. We're able to do that because that those things are going to become our focus so yeah i think you know this this pandemic this 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 tough year that we've all had is actually a great opportunity and th that's the way we should all look at it and that, that that's firmly how i'm looking at it and do you think there's um enough support for people within the industry um so if they do need help when it comes to mental health um you know i know obviously you guys are saying like the shorter shorter working weeks and that work-life balance and things like that but what kind of things do you have in place for people that that you know that you realize that they're struggling uh, well I only employ three members of staff so for me it's quite easy because there's only you know I see my three members of staff for those three and a half days a week so we can and I can see if anything is wrong uh, but I don't I don't think it's an industry problem 
we are very stiff up up a lip when that we don't one we don't ask for help and two we don't offer help so it's i don't think it's an industry thing i don't think as hospitality staff we should put the pressure on ourselves to think that we're not doing enough yes we're not doing enough we're not doing enough as a nation we should all try and do more as personal people as in ourselves and with that hospitality will get better with it because we, we we've we've led such a life that it doesn't matter so we have to get better in our own lives before hospitality is going to get better anyway i think but in all fairness one thing i will say i think that change has started to happen and has been happening for a long time already i think the reality is the stuff that we went through when we were growing up in this industry that that that's you know that's and i've said this before and I, you know, I, I will strongly, you know, advocate advocate it is the fact that those that was back then. That's no longer really. Yeah. yeah, you got you got certain places where things are, and that's a very individual thing where people are a bit more brutal, and that's down to them and that particular kitchen. But I think as a whole within the industry, see, like within within the industry, um, it's like that scene out of uh, you know, <laughs> one of my favorite. <laughs> Like, yeah so you know I, I think that and i know what, what, what mark says that it's more a society issue as opposed to just a, uh, an industry issue because i certainly agree because like, like like callum you know how he's the environment is within his kitchen it's it's a great kitchen like uh, let's talk about brad we spoke about brad earlier on this week you know the the camaraderie and the actual um uh environment that they've built within them that kitchen it's it's a very much unlike what we people think. You know, same in our kitchen. It's not like what people think, and, and, and I think we need to like almost stop blaming the industry, as it were. We need to start thinking about the pressures that society put on individuals. That's what needs to be addressed, and then we also need to look at: is the help out there? Is the help accessible? is I think the stigma around seeking help, I think that's, that's also moved on as well. You know, there's, there's absolutely nothing wrong in a man saying, you know what, I'm struggling with my mental health, I'm struggling with um, my emotions or feelings or dealing with this, that, and the other. For, for a couple of blokes to sit there talking about that now, I think it's, it's quite, quite normal, it's become. So I personally think it's, you know, we need to look at the pressures that society is putting on individuals and see what what's what what are the causes. I think there is a, a massive massive need or or push on people to achieve certain things, live a certain lifestyle, enjoy certain things, or be involved in certain things. And if you're not, if you don't can't attain this or do that, then you're you're a failure in life. But I look at like some of the younger kids that work with me, like and one of my, you know, he's like he's, he's like my adopted kid essentially. <laughs> but you know, I watched this kid and I remember, you know, once he got his first pay pack, he went out there and he spent 350, 400 quid on a, on a, on this belt. Um, and, 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 and I said to him, like, you worked all month and then you've gone out and wasted it on this. Like, why did you do that? Oh, wow, it's so cool. And he used to wear it with such great brother. And then, you know, then six, seven, eight hundred quid on a pair of trainers the month after. And I could see because the pressure on these guys were to live a certain lifestyle and to, you know, and that's where the pressure is coming from. And if they can't achieve that and attain that, then they're almost looked as either failures or, or, or you know, they, they weren't, you know, living their best life, as it were. And that, that's the thing. And that's that's where I think the biggest problem is. People aren't just happy to just be. Like, like look, me, I, you know, I'm not saying anything here, but look, at the end of the day, I've, in the last, I don't know, last four years, I've spent nearly six, six and a half, seven million pounds on restaurants and stuff like that. Yeah, I'm quite happy walking around in the, an H&M T-shirt. I don't need to go out and spend... Yeah, I mean, obviously, I, you know, I, I like you know a few other bits and bobs, but I don't feel the need. I don't feel compelled to do so because it doesn't make me a lesser person. Doesn't make me a lesser man because my wealth is in the people around me. My wealth is in the things that I build. But what's happened is 
the, the pressure that people, uh, society and consumerism and, and that, that style of, co that culture that, 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 that these young kids are put under, I think that's where the biggest pressure is. And the other thing as well, unless you're like, you know, we spoke about a waterfall earlier on this week as well, unless you're taking pictures like that and, you know, living this incredible Instagram life, like your life's shit. No, sitting at home with friends, enjoying a beer, that's living your best life. That's great. You're surrounded by beautiful people who love you, who care about you. And in a comfort, that, that, those are the things that we should get people to understand and value. Whereas what we're, what's happening now is the, the pressure to live this make-believe fantasy life because it's put in front of you every day. And that's what people think that they have to live their life like that. And if they're not doing that, they're failures. And I, th I think that's what's causing the biggest like issues and mental health issues within, 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 within our people. That, that's my opinion. I personally don't think it's, it's brutality at work. Because let's be honest, most of the, the people who are, who are known for that, they've either mellowed out or they're dead. They don't exist anymore. Yeah, no, it's, well, it's, it's really interesting and like a really interesting point. And like you said, we did touch on it, didn't we, with like social media and the, the kind of pressures of pressures of social media. I suppose take, listening to both of you, I suppose the thing to take from it is that maybe we need to talk about what is what we do right within the industry, as opposed to keep going back to what was what has been wrong with the industry. So highlighting the amazing things that now, you know, like you said, those kitchens don't exist anymore. So and that hopefully with generations coming through, they'll never never come back again i think like kids are now they're more like families now that's that's how i see it because all my friends restaurants all of people that i know and i i see how they are with their team and they are they are like especially within kitchens which is one of the toughest parts of a restaurant not taking anything away from front of house but i can only talk about the environment that i'm surrounded by and what what touches my my you know my life and 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 you know, for me, I, I, I feel that there, there is that sense of, yeah, it's just family and sense of belonging. And you definitely get that in independence. I, I can't speak about what life is like working for chains and stuff like that. I can only imagine not probably nowhere near as nice as, as it is to work with, with independence. But, you know, at the end of the day, that's the choice for these people to make. And if they've chosen to work for that space, well, maybe if their their jobs aren't fulfilling and they still want to cook, then find yourself a good independent restaurant and get yourself in there and find the family and find the team and, and, and be part of that. But, you know, me personally, looking at the people that I work, work with, people that I know, and I see how they talk about their team. And they're all senior chefs, you know, because, you know, we're all of a similar age and how they talk about their teams, like their family. I... I, I, ne I don't actually hear that anymore. You know, you, you don't have those conversations. Yeah, I took this guy out, um, you know, and I, I absolutely tore him apart and blah, blah, blah. No, no one gloats about stuff like that anymore because it's not a nice thing to gloat about. And I think that's become an accepted thing. No one in the industry turns out and said, oh, yeah, yeah you're, you're the fucking man for tearing that kid apart. No one says that. You, the general consensus is like, well, that's a bit harsh, mate. So... You know, it's it's. I I genuinely believe, you know, kitchens now have changed. That tide has changed. I think the problems with mental health are more around society and the pressures that society puts on these younger people that are coming up. Because you know the pressures that we had, we dealt with a lot of it was physical, whereas now it's mental and emotional which are things that guys like me and you, we're, we're totally, you know, we, 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 you know we, can't, we can't answer that. We can't speak about it. But I, I genuinely think with, these, with the people coming through now and the, their problems are very, very, yeah, very much caused by society and the pressures that society puts on them, not there, not working in, in kitchens. I don't, I don't agree with that anymore. Okay. Okay. Brilliant. Well, thank you both for talking about that. Um, we started this podcast with Great British Menu, so I think it'd be quite fun to end it with Great British Menu. And my final question for you both is, if you could pick a theme for you both to compete against each other, we're going back to Great British Menu, you two are competing. What theme would it be um, and, uh, and why? I'll go first. 
And uh, I'm only saying this, it's not because of Actar. Uh, well, it's because of Actar. Because I competed against Actar, I've been lucky enough to travel around India uh, because I got noticed by some Indian companies and I got invited to travel around India and cooking uh, as part of a British contingent five times. I've been to Chandigarh, Chennai, Delhi, Calcutta and Bangalore because of that man there. Uh, and I actually believe that I've been to India more times than most Indian chefs in the UK. And you probably back me up on that, Akhtar. So if I was to do Great British Menu against Akhtar, I would do it with regional Indian food because I believe I know more. Not than Akhtar, because I know he knows more than fucking I do. More <laughs> I thought you were going to say more than Akhtar then. <laughs> more than most Indian chefs in this fucking country. Okay. And if you and Ak so do you, so you think you could beat Akhtar at that? Or, or no, give, it, I, give him a good, good run for his money? I could definitely put my spin on it and he'd enjoy it. And if not, we'd have a fucking laugh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll definitely, definitely. Do we get to call uh, Jason? Because it's, it's not the same without him, is it? <laughs> yeah, bring him back, all three of you. <laughs> I, mean, I don't know how we'd take the invite. He'd probably tell us to fuck off. But... <laughs> <laughs> as long as Mark is good. <laughs> Yeah, you have to have Marcus as a judge. You can't, you know, we can't mess around here. Let's have it as it was. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we've got to, yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, <laughs> like, I recently worked with Marcus on uh, on 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 Master Chef, and uh, you know, his journey and understanding of spice over the last few years is, is you know, he was just talk, telling me about that and how you know he's learning so much and 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 appreciating so much more about. Indian flavors and Indian and spice. And a lot of it's through the journey through MasterChef. So I think, you know, Marcus is, is you know, definitely, definitely the man to judge that channel challenge because, yeah, I mean, you know, he definitely has an appreciation for Asian flavors. So, yeah, that's the one. So we've got Marcus. We just need to uh, see if we can get Jason in. <laughs> well, I really hope that happens because I think that would be a very fun episode to watch. <laughs> so, it, it's watching just to let you know, we're, we're just it is, we're just having a laugh and a joke, mate. You know what happened ten years ago? That was then, and it, it, it's it's just become a little running joke of ours. It's, it's just it's just it's it's fun and it's all said in jest. So, uh, you know, we're we're all competing against each other, and the whole idea was to basically fuck each other up mentally because. <laughs> We're all there because we're there because everyone's there because you can cook. You don't want to go on there because you know you, you you can put some toast in a toast there. You know we're all there because so and the same applied with Jason. You know he was there because he could cook, but that whole week was it's it is it, there was a lot of psychological warfare in it because you had to get that edge on the other person. I feel yeah, like you and Jason and Mark all just need to go for a beer and reminisce from ten years ago. Get. get with... <laughs> <laughs> thank well, you yeah. both um <laughs> I, I thank you I've, I've really enjoyed it thank you for being so honest as well um it, on certain topics because um i just think it's really good for people to hear people being honest about certain subjects so thank you very much for that um, i'm going to let you both go um Akhtar, i will speak to you for one final episode that will be our Ooh. last episode um but yeah thank you very much mark thank you very much for joining us um, it's been an absolute pleasure and I will speak to you soon. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank Cheers. you. This episode of Grilled is sponsored by Rationale, your leading provider in multifunctional hot food preparation equipment. Register now for a free Rationale live demo at www.rationale-online.com.